So in addressing dysfunctional breathing patterns, it's very important to look at the effect of rhinitis. And rhinitis basically means blocked or runny nose. Um, but it, it's a core mobility effect. In other words, that we're not just talking about the effect on the nose. If the nose is blocked and mouth breathing is going to be inevitable, um, it has a huge knock-on effect for the rest of you know, health, including, say, for instance, with a child, children's development, for example. So rhinitis, it's rarely found in isolation. Um, it's very common in asthma. And another aspect would be rhinosinusitis. And people with rhinitis, they're more than twice as likely to suffer problems sleeping due to their nasal allergy symptoms. So rhinitis has a huge effect on causing disturbed sleep. And of course, if sleep is disturbed, we wake up exhausted. And this then in turn is affecting our productivity and our behavior for the rest of the day. With this paper, it's been well recognized that, you know, people would ask me because they feel that they're not getting enough air through their nose, they'll often open them out. We speculate that asthmatics may have an increased tendency to switch to oral breathing, a factor that may contribute to the pathogenesis of their asthma. This here, it's a very interesting paper. It's written by two anesthetists, Dr. Laffey and Dr. Kavanagh and it's published in the New England Journal of Medicine. The title of the paper is Hypocapnia, and in that they look at the effect of hypocapnia, which is low carbon dioxide, on different um, bodily, and bodily functions, including asthma. So with this diagram here, which I took from the paper, um, it looks at the effect of hyperventilation at the bottom, and how this in turn is contributing to airway hypocapnia, which in turn is causing smooth muscle of the airways to constrict, and of course then there's more mucus being released into the airways, probably in an attempt of the airways to treat raw and inflamed tissue, that more mucus is released, maybe to calm down the airways to some extent. But both of these effects, the effect of smooth muscle contraction, as well as increased amounts of mucus, that increases airway resistance. And that in turn is going to increase the work of breathing because as the airways become narrow, you feel you're not getting enough air, so you're gonna start breathing harder. So it increases the work of breathing. That in turn then increases the sensation of breathlessness, which in turn feeds back into hyperventilation and completes the cycle. So you're back into hyperventilation, back into airway hypocapnia. So it's really an important cycle to recognize in the field of asthma because if we can help reduce hyperventilation, we can reduce the knock-on effect. And literally, by asking a child or adult with asthma to breathe through their nose, it's absolutely the first step to addressing hyperventilation. Breathing through the nose will help to restore more normal breathing volume. Now, I'm not saying that we'll do it completely, and because we also need to change breathing, but most certainly, nasal breathing is the first step. That we can teach people with asthma how to break this cycle. Um, and the results will be, of course, that they'll feel better, and they will have a higher breath hold time, just what we spoken about earlier. Rhinitis and the effect on sleep. Open mouth breathing during sleep is a risk factor for obstructive sleep apnea and is associated with increased disease severity and upper airway collapsibility because of course the mouth is open, the lower jaw hinges downwards, the airways, upper airways are smaller and as a result there's a greater likelihood of holding the breath. This paper here, one of the authors of it is Dr. Christian Guimino. And in 1975, he noticed that patients with hypertension, um, both himself and his research group, they started investigating, was it linked to their sleep? And they noticed that, of course, that individuals who were holding their breath during their sleep had hypertension, high blood pressure. So it was their team and himself that coined the phrase obstructive sleep apnea. So literally, he's seen as one of the most um, educated individuals in this field. And it's very interesting here that he looks, and I quote, that the treatment of pediatric obstructive sleep apnea and sleep disorder breathing means restoration of continuous nose breathing during wakefulness and sleep. So here's the founding father of obstructive sleep apnea coming out and talking about the importance of nose breathing um, in the treatment of pediatric obstructive sleep apnea. This paper here, also co-authored by Dr. Christian Guimano, 
the case against mouth breathing is growing and given its negative consequences, we feel that restoration of the nasal breathing route as early as possible is critical. I go on with the same paper. In fact, restoration of nasal breathing during wake and sleep may be the only valid, complete correction of pediatric sleep disorder breathing. This is huge. This is the recognition and the realization of the importance of nose breathing in helping children with sleep disorder breathing. And it's not just children we're talking about here. We can also help adults with sleep disorder breathing. So sleep disorder breathing, poor school performance and hyperactivity are all mental complications seen in many children related to their nasal allergies. And what's happening here is that a child who is, their nose is blocked, um, they've got higher incidence of snoring, higher incidence of obstructive sleep apnea, the child of course is waking up exhausted. And whereas an adult will be exhausted during the day and it will affect of course their productivity and work and everything else, a child who is exhausted tends to be hyperactive. That sleep disorder breathing affects children differently to adults. And in this paper here, most children with ADHD displayed symptoms and skin prick test results consisted with allergic rhinitis. Nasal obstruction and other symptoms of allergic rhinitis could explain some of the cognitive patterns observed in ADHD, which may result from sleep disturbances known to occur with allergic rhinitis. Many of these children are misdiagnosed with attention deficit disorder and hyperactivity. And there's a growing volume of research looking at this, that yes, if the child is presenting with symptoms of ADD, let's look at sleep. The effect of mouth breathing on the craniofacial element of it. So here, um, Harari's paper, mouth breathers demonstrated a considerable backward and downward rotation of the mandible, increased over jet or buck teeth, increase in the mandible plane angle, so they have a longer face. Because literally when the mouth is open, the whole face sinks. So over the years, I see teenagers, I see adults, and of course I see children who were exhibiting these, you know, craniofacial changes, which literally could have been avoided. Um, I have some of the craniofacial changes. You know, if you look at the shape of my face, it's longer than what it should be. And also my maxilla, which is my top jaw set back. My maxilla should be about 20 millimeters forward. My mandible is set back, and because my mandible is set back, my upper airways are smaller. Um, so literally the whole face sinks downwards and grows in length due to the mouth hanging open. I've got a very narrow palate. Um, I have, for example, crooked teeth. I had problems, of course, with sleeping, with everything else. And this stems back to the changes that happened as a result of the seemingly innocuous traits of mouth breathing. So children with obligate mouth breathing due to nasal septum deviations show facial and dental anomalies in comparison to nose breathing controls. And during the 1970s, Dr. Harvold, he conducted experiments on monkeys and basically he wanted to find out the effect that mouth breathing was on the shape of the face of monkeys. So he had three groups of monkeys um, and with one group, he, he surgically blocked the noses of the monkeys. So the monkeys then were forced to breathe through the mouths. Now, the results that he found was that the mouth-breathing monkeys developed the same craniofacial abnormalities that we're finding in humans. And people, parents often say to me, that's a dreadful experiment, you know, it's cruelty to animals. And I say, I totally agree with you, but we never learned from it. You know, hundreds of thousands of children are partaking in those experiments today because our failure and our neglect as healthcare specialists to teach children the importance of nose breathing means that it's going to have a knock-on effect in the development and the shape of the child's face, but not just the shape of their face, their development in terms of behavior, cognitive development, um, you know, for the rest of their life, because the growth of a child's face is estimated that 60% of the growth of the face takes place before six years of age and 90% of the growth of the face takes place before 12 years of age. So we've got a very brief window to help to ensure normal breathing patterns during that time. It means that whatever abnormalities that develop in the child's face, by the time the child is 18, it's too late. 
You know, there's nothing that can be done, and especially those features, including setback of the mandible. Because when the mandible is set back, the airways are smaller, so it increases our risk of obstructive sleep apnea. So it's really something to, you know, to be worth considering. So an example of the effects of mouth breathing can be shown by this photograph here. I got, took the photograph from an orthodontist called Dr. John Mew. And this boy here is a 10 year old boy. Um, he's a nose breather and he's got a you know, relatively good looking broad face and everything is in proportion. And on the boy's 40th birthday, he was given a gerbil or a hamster as a present, and he took an aller allergic reaction to it. So his nose began to block, and as a result then, of course, it caused him to breathe through his mouth. Within three years, the shape of his face had changed considerably. This is what we're talking about. You see that the face has sank down. You see the whiteness under the eyes. Um, you see the longer facial structure. The nose looks very big because the maxilla is set back. And because the maxilla is set back, you see that the mandible is even set further back. These craniofacial changes are absolutely influenced by the fact that the child had the mouth open. We see the lower lip. The lower lip is flaccid because it's just hanging there. And more importantly, this could have been avoided. Another therapy which is pretty well known for helping to address craniofacial abnormalities and even better to prevent them is myofunctional therapy. And it involves a neuromuscular re-education of the oral facial muscles with a series of exercises which are designed to eliminate oral habits such as nail biting, thumb sucking and lip licking, to help improve the static and dynamic tongue position, to help improve lip seal to enhance nasal breathing and also to promote proper chewing and swallowing. Myofunctional therapy it has received quite, quite a lot of attention in recent years with a number of research papers supporting the efficacy of it in paediatric sleep disorder breathing and obstructive sleep apnea in adults. For example, this paper here, which is co-authored by Dr. Christian Guimino, and it's titled The Critical Role of Myofascial Re-Education in Paediatric Sleep Disorder Breathing. The conclusion reached in this research paper was that absence of myofunctional treatment is associated with a recurrence of sleep disorder breathing. So in order to ensure lifelong improvements of a reduction of, for example, sleep disorder breathing, which includes snoring, sleep apnea, um, myofunctional therapy is quite a useful adjunct.